Chair Johnson? Here. Mayor Jones? Here. Supervisor Madrone? Mayor Burgell? Here. Council Member Atkins Salazar? Here. Council Member Jorgensen? Here. Council Member Tuttle? Council Member Orr? PAC Member Arroyo? Here. PAC Member Allstrand? Here. Okay. All right, thank you. And if we have no presentations today, and at this time we'll take public comment on non-agenda items. I can do that if we're so at this time we will uh, see if there's any public comment on non agenda items. And seeing none, we'll move to the consent calendar. We have one item and it's approval of the meeting record. I so move. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any public comment for the consent calendar? I don't see any. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. So that motion passes. And we. Yes, it should have. <laughs> we can do it now, I suppose. Well, and at this time, we'll adjourn as the HCOG board and convene as the policy advisory committee and move to action items. <laughs> and we have the 2023 2028 five year Humboldt County Transit Development Plan. Yes, thank you. I'm going to turn this presentation over to our consultant who prepared the plan um, uh, for their presentation. They're going to go through um, pretty much start to finish um, how this worked out. We have had a lot of public involvement in the formation of this plan. Uh, and um, so I think that uh, and, and also a lot of involvement by the transit operators. So I think that we've got a good plan that's reflective of um, the comments we received. And um, with that, I'll let LSE take it away and um, we can ask questions at the end of their presentation. Gordon, Gordon, you're still on mute. There we go. How about now? You hear me all right? You're pretty quiet. We'll see what we can do on our end to see if we can get you a little louder. Hang on. Oh, just just give us a sec. It's still pretty quiet. I think it's audio on our end. One second, please. Test, test, Ooh. test. Loud and clear. Thank you. Ah, okay. Should I be whispering now? Uh, all right. Um, with that, I'll just introduce myself, and uh, then Claire can introduce herself. Um, my name is Gordon Shaw. I'm a transportation engineer and planner and, and have worked on transit plans now for 42 years, um, including probably about the last 12 or 15 years working on uh, plans in, in Humboldt County, a wide variety of plans over the years. Uh, um, and we specialize in working on transit plans for more um, rural areas and smaller communities rather than big cities. Um, and I think that gives us very good background for this plan. Um, Claire Hutchinson has um, been very instrumental in, uh, in working on this plan. I'll let her say hi. 
Um, hi, everyone. I'm a transportation planner with LSC. I've been here for about two years. So this is one of actually my first bigger projects I've seen start to finish. Um, it's been really fun to work on. And I think the final plan is detailed and covers so much ground and so much of what Humboldt is looking for. So excited for the presentation. Okay. Uh, with that, I do have a, a PowerPoint uh, presentation to, to work through. Um, it's kind of high level because there's a lot of detail here. I, I will say that of all the areas that I've worked on, this is the most uh, kind of comprehensive uh, transit plan that we have done. And it really reflects how, how comprehensive the transit network is in Humboldt County and the number of different providers that we have to think our way through um, and different considerations. So um, this is, this is a, uh, a, a lot in here. Um, as uh, Beth mentioned, uh, this process started with a lot of review of existing services and trends and so on, some of which have been uh, kind of challenging over the last few years. Uh, it's getting better lately. Uh, and there's a lot of detail in the, in the final document, the draft final document um, to, uh, to look at. Um, and then um, we've worked our way through uh, a lot of review of the community and uh, demographics of the area. We've, we've looked at previous plans. We've spent a lot of time talking to people like Cal Poly Humboldt on what their plans are in the various cities in the county on their plans. Um, and then a real deep dive into the existing services and what makes them tick and how they operate and how their finances work. And we've worked together. We've we've developed a uh, a comprehensive five year plan here. I'm I'm going to uh, dive into a PowerPoint here, which I assume will show up if I do this. How are we doing on the screen? Yep, we got yes. it. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, one of the most important words on this screen is draft. Um, I this this is still a draft document. It has been vetted by your staff. It's been vetted by the transit agencies and the the city and the municipalities and so on. Um, but um, this is a, a a document that we hope you think you can take a look at. And if you see needs for um, some final modifications to that. That's why the word draft is is on there. Um, after today's uh, discussion, uh, we are hoping to make any final changes in, in your direction and turn it into a, a final plan that can be that can guide uh, services for the next five years. Um, I have hit a little bit of this um, as I, in my preface. But uh, this is what we've been doing over the last year or so. Um, and we've been um, working on reviewing existing conditions, a lot of detail on looking at potential solutions and alternatives. Um, and then uh, what we're really developing here is what I like to call a business plan, a five-year plan that is, that is focuses on the dollars and the capacity of the staff and so on to actually get things done and get things implemented. Um, so if you wanna think about this as a document that really tells your, your Council of Governments, Association of Governments on where to put, put their focus and then where to, to spend their time and, and the, the dollars that go to the different transit agencies um, and hopefully it's also a guide for the transit agencies as to how to develop their services um, in a comprehensive manner. Um, that's, that's a good way to think about this. Um, as Beth mentioned, we've done a lot of uh, public input uh, through this process. We've done onboard surveys on all the different services. Uh, we've done an online community survey. Uh, we've done stakeholder interviews. We've had two very lively community workshops. I must say that you have a, a lot of people in the, in the community that, that care and are interested in, in public transit and some of the benefits that can come from public transit. And that's been a, a help as we go through this. Uh, and then we also had a second online survey uh, after we had uh, alternatives to look at. So 
we feel like we've got a good understanding of what, what people uh, are looking for. This chart here is a, a good uh, kind of word cloud uh, summary of what words we hear when we ask how you would describe your ideal transit system. And you can see frequent and reliable and safe and convenient. They all come up very often um, in, in the comments that we received. Um, I will say too that we took this information and we took our review of the services and, and really tried to think through as we went through this, how can we expand the market, the, uh, the, the types of people and the types of trips that people use to take uh, public transit um, so that we can uh, get beyond kind of the traditional markets for transit and think about people who may have access to a car or yeah, they'll, they'll choose transit because it makes their lives better. So you'll see that in our plan. Um, we think of uh, the, the process here as really starting from the service plan. Where are the buses gonna go? Where are the vans gonna go? When are they gonna go? What's the service look like? From that, that really starts to drive what, what kind of vehicles do we need? And what kind of uh, facilities do we need? Together, that starts to drive how much money we need for the financial plans. And we also work into that, and we'll talk about marketing strategies uh, to expand the markets, as I mentioned. So kind of leaping about 170 pages or so into this document, um, there is a plan chapter at the end that really tries to roll everything up. Um, and if you have um, you want to focus in on one part of the document that is really kind of the, the plan going forward. It's that, that final chapter, final two chapters in this case. Um, but uh, I, I'd like to just take a minute and kind of uh, lay out the big picture of where we, where we ended up. Um, you can see the things that we are aiming for here of addressing the comments and input, improving the transit performance, uh, taking advantage of near-term funding opportunities. Uh, I will say as an aside that one of the important functions of a, of a transit development plan is that it's the document that funding agencies like the state will look at and say, okay, you've given us a grant application for X for this service improvement or this capital improvement. Is it in your transit plan? Um, and it's it's kind of an issue if it's not in there, um, it, because they want to see that their dollars are being spent in a comprehensive and, and thought out way. Um, so that's kind of a, a key function of our transit plan here. Uh, we tend to then think about, well, if you have a need for, if you think there's a, a good opportunity for a certain improvement, let's put it in the plan. Um, and we've, we've kind of leaned in that direction to, to be kind of proactive on putting things in the plan. Um, this is a five-year plan though, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but it is, it is kind of a short-term strategy. It basically takes the world kind of as it is um, and says, how, how can we make the world better in the short term? Um, there are longer-term planning processes, like when a area does a long range land use or community or transportation plan that can think about uh, broader uh, issues. But this really kind of focuses on how are we doing now and how can we do it better? And I mentioned the last one there about attracting new riders, thinking about what's keeping people in their car when they could be on transit. I want to now kind of go off in a little bit in, in the details here as a preface because one of the things you'll see here in a lot of parts of the, the plan is microtransit. And um, the idea uh, that is really becoming a very popular thing around the country and across the state of essentially providing a public service level type service that's similar to an Uber service where you use an app. You can see the smartphone there. Everybody's got one, it seems like these days, although you don't have to have one to use this service. Um, but you can use that app and you download it and you, within a, a moment or a few minutes, you can say, please pick me up at my home or please pick me up at a nearby street corner. And uh, it will automatically uh, use advanced technologies to 
to dispatch the van and then tell you that your van will be there in 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And you can watch it in real time as it gets closer. It'll be 15, it'll be 10, it'll be five. And you can look down the street and here comes your van. Um, this is a, uh, a good way to serve lower density areas or lower, lower demand times where a fixed route doesn't make too much sense and is, um, is something that has been successfully implemented in a lot of other transit systems. Um, I, I mentioned a few there. Uh, Napa, Truckee, Reno, um, Sacramento has got eight different zones now. Um, there's new services in, in Vacaville. There are new services that are being implemented in, in, uh, over in Butte County. So it's, uh, it's a tool and you'll see it in a variety of different areas. So I want to go back here now that I've mentioned that to this map on the right. Um, and this is kind of a map of overview of the transit plan, the service plan. Um, and you can see a number of different elements. First of all, I mentioned microtransit and we've got uh, four zones and then could expand into a fifth zone over on the peninsula um, over time um, along the 101 corridor. Um, and you can, I, I liken this to kind of a string of pearls plan so we've got a we've got the string, which is the RTS service from Fort, Fortuna up to McKinleyville, and we've got the pearls, which are the improvements in the in the local services uh, that include microtransit as well as some other things that we're going to mention here. Um, you can see some other key things here. Just to the overall uh, plan here, we've got in the plan express service, so very limited stop service from Arcata down to Eureka. It could start at some point up in McKinleyville to Arcata to Eureka and down to, to a college of the Siskiyous. Uh, that could be connecting to a series of park and rides that can start to, to get people out of their cars in a fast ride into places like, like the hospitals or to the county and Caltrans offices or to uh, Cal Poly. Um, we've got a new route in, um, in uh, Arcata that we're calling the green route. Um, a bit of a, a modification on the new bus that's been put in there. Uh, we've got Earth Center improvements. We've got Mobility Hub improvements in Arcata. We've got a Mobility Hub in McKinleyville. Um, and we also have some other key elements that we'll mention, um, including Sunday service. And you already know about the RCX service down to, to uh, Ukiah. Um, and we'll hit some of these other ones as we go through the rest of the presentation here. So uh, diving into the details on the RTS service, um, we see this as an important element to, to do that step of getting people out of their cars that are currently looking at the schedule and say, it takes me an extra half hour to get to work if I take the bus because of all the stops and so on. Um, so this is, this is kind of a important, and it's really kind of our key uh, strategy for getting people out of their cars to, on longer commutes. Um, we can start with uh, three round trips in the morning and six round trips in the afternoon with one vehicle. We can expand that uh, between Cal Poly and Eureka. We can expand that over time um, to uh, be a longer corridor and put two buses out there. It really has two benefits. It reduces the travel time, and then it puts a lot more buses between the activity centers over the course of those peak periods. So there's a lot shorter wait between buses. You can see that kind of ridership increase we think we'll get out of that, out of based upon some very detailed analysis. Um, one one caveat on this is that it is an RT. It would be an RTS service, but it would require a separate funding arrangement from the current RTS uh, uh, factors of 50% county and then 50% split by community based on population uh, because there's, there's really no need for the services south of the College of the Redwoods um, to uh, provide this service. I think I said, yeah. Um, as, a, as a secondary improvement, we heard a lot of, of desire for Sunday service, um, and we've got some strategies in for, for doing that. Uh, we think that that is 
probably more like a few years out and it's going to take some additional funding than what we have now that's going to take some grant request it also would be much uh, more effective if it was more than just RTS um, so that you could get to RTS say in Eureka from the neighborhoods rather than just have to get yourself to the RTS stops and in Fortuna and so on um, or into in Arcata. So it's got you can see the ridership potential on that is relatively low when we look at it compared with other area with with other options based upon Sunday ridership in other areas. But I would say that it is an important thing for people, more people to start to think about, I don't need that car or I don't need the second car or I'm, I'm a college student. and I don't need to bring a car because there's a seven day a week transit service. So it is a good step towards moving towards you know, a real kind of transit lifestyle. Um, more details on uh, microtransit. Here is a map of the zone that we could be providing microtransit uh, service in. Um, one of the uh, kind of key strategies here, you see implement incrementally. And there's kind of two different ways that microtransit has been rolled out in other areas. There's the expensive way, um, which actually is where I live in uh, the, the Tahoe area, where you go out and you buy a lot of vans and you start a big service at once and you really market it. And um, it's, it can be effective, but it's also very expensive to start that way. Uh, the town of Truckee, California, which is about only about 18,000 people, they're spending about $1.8 million just on their microtransit service. Um, so that's, that's the expensive way to go. The other way to go and where we're, what we're suggesting here is to start with the dial -a ride service and, and to kind of incrementally improve that and open it to the public and um, don't do a big rollout and you know, get a lot of demand on day one, but to, to expand it slowly um, and let it kind of grow organically and into a service and see where that balance is. There is a danger on microtransit that you can you can get demand that you can't meet, um, so that's we're we're being cautious on that. But you can see it's a substantial ridership there, and it ties in with the McKinleyville Mobility Plan and the idea of a transit hub there. Um, same sort of thing in Eureka, gradually implement it, more ridership there. Um, so that's that's something that we think could be started slowly. And once it's up and running, then we'll take a look at some of that service could go over the, the bridge and over to the peninsula. And it may be the best way to serve Samoa and Manila and the peninsula area. Um, Sunday transit service, we've, we've got a strategy here for basically running two buses on Sunday service and implementing that. Um, again, probably not too much ridership, uh, generated on Sunday service, but it's a it's a good step. The other caveat on Sunday service is that you need to you need to hire more than just the drivers. Um, you also need to have the staff to um, <clears throat> to staff the uh, if there's any breakdowns. So you need a mechanic, and if you need if you have one mechanic, safety uh, requirements say you need two mechanics, and you need a dispatcher. So it's it's a kind of a more expensive thing than just let's put a bus out on Sunday and, and see how it does. Um, while I'm talking about uh, Eureka Transit System as part of the the HTA services, uh, we looked at some different options for routing and redesigning the system. Uh, overall, the transit routes, which can look complicated. Um, they do a good job of covering the community with four buses, which is a, a, it's a challenging thing to do, uh, and providing pretty good transit coverage and travel times for most trips. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've got some ideas on re rescheduling the services so that it really ties in with the, the third and H transfer hub uh, and when it converts over to Earth Center. Um, and so that it really starts to serve more as, as a feeder system into the RTS main line. So we think we can, for essentially no cost, we can retweak the schedules and get some more ridership out of that. Um, some other HTA plan elements. Um, 
We looked at Southern Humboldt inner city and didn't see any need for changes to that service. There may be some need as the, the service to Eureka or to Ukiah grows to look at how that can be um, coordinated better with that service. Uh, one of the, the only real reduction that, we, that we're recommending in this service uh, in services is we looked at the Willow Creek service and on Saturday, it really is very low ridership for the cost that we're, we're spending out there. Um, I'm a good transit advocate, but when you start to see numbers like 120 or $130 of subsidy needed to move one passenger, um, you have to say that that's not a good use of taxpayer dollars. It's doing much better on weekdays, so we didn't change anything there, but those that we can save quite a lot of money on, on by focusing on weekdays rather than on Saturday. Um, We've got some suggestions in here about dial -a ride and how to make it more efficient. Uh, right now, there's a pretty good number of, of uh, or percentage of trip requests that end up being a no-show. So the van goes out there and they're not there. And it's about 8%, which is a relatively high number. Um, and about 20% of people make a reservation and then will cancel at the last minute. And we've already started at the van service. And again, that makes things more expensive for everybody. So that's a matter of kind of uh, more definition on the policies and more consistent application of them. Uh, the last one there too is, is kind of digging into the weeds a little bit, but uh, there's an existing funding agreement for dial ride services um, that is based upon the number of ADA registered people um, and then the number of rides, but it's not based upon the cost of providing service to different areas. And it's uh, so about two or three times more expensive uh, for the dial -a ride service to serve somebody in McKinleyville or way down south in the dial -a ride area as it is in Eureka. Um, and so we've got recommendations in there about how to put the cost of service, the number of minutes and, and co associated costs uh, of that service into the plan, into the funding agreement so that it's a bit more equitable. And it really does kind of rattle through to the rest of the system because right now Eureka in particular is they're spending all their transit dollars um, on transit. They're not spending any of it on streets and roads. And because they're spending so much on the dial -a ride, they can't do other things. They can't do other improvements. So this is where they, we could free up some money there. It would take some other funding from other uh, entities, but that would uh, allow the overall system to be more uh, expanded. All right, um, this gets easier and faster uh, as I go through it. Um, the A and R MRTS service, the uh, Arcata service, uh, we looked at a lot of different alternatives for Arcata. Um, basically, they're doing an incredible job with two buses um, and they've, we just started a third bus that kind of does a north loop, uh, but we've, we've ended up developing a, a route here. This would be operated, we're calling it the green route, and it would be operated with one bus. Um, and instead of being focused on the transit center downtown, it would really be focused on Library Circle at Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, and it would, every hour it could do a loop. This actually expands south, um, of Arcata Boulevard or Samoa Boulevard and, and serve some new neighborhoods down here, which has been a long-term desire. So there's about a 20, 15 minute loop, comes back to, to Library Circle and then does a loop in the center here. Where there's actually quite a lot of, of uh, uh, transit uh, ridership along Alliance Road. So it does a loop in the clockwise direction, comes back, then it does a big clockwise loop on the north end. Um, and what that does is it gives us a, a direct route, direct run every hour from the you know, Craftsman Mall area into Cal Poly back out again, as well as sort of good service for the north end of town getting to and from Cal Poly. Um, this would only be when, when college is in session, um, but it could generate quite a lot of ridership. Um, and basically it's a, now it's a redesign of the, the current third bus route. Uh, we also looked at a lot of different options for expanding the hours of service. And the one that made sense to us was starting uh, the orange route, the one bus 
kind of comprehensive loop one hour earlier um, to so that people can get to where they're going by 7 or 7.30 rather than have to wait for a bus that may, might, might not show up to their stop until 7.30. And we could get some good ridership out of that. And we also have discussion about Sunday service for Arcata. Um, also, microtransit service, uh, again, making it available to the public and gradually implement it. Uh, kind of cast a wide net here of including some of the outlying employee sites. Um, again, this is something that would be attractive to people that are not close to a bus route or the bus route is kind of long, longer distance um, or longer travel times. Um, it goes down to Sunny Bray and Bayside. So it does pick up some of that, that request for service in Bayside um, that we've, we've heard for many years. So that's another element. Um, going south to Fortuna, uh, microtransit service, uh, basically it's city limits. And um, one of the benefits of this down in, Fort in Fortuna is that that could allow the RTS service to uh, not have to go kind of east of Fortuna Boulevard, at least when the when the microtransit service is going, it might still go late in the evening and so on. Um, but it allows that to allows us to streamline that. It saves some dollars on the transit side, on the fixed route transit side. It it speeds the travel times. So um, there's some good strategy there to improve both services. So we think it would get a good amount of ridership increase. Um, uh, it does have a cost impact. Uh, it would be more costly to put this service on over time, uh, but uh, it, it could, could be a benefit. Uh, okay, that was the service plan. It does get easier too as we get into the details here on the capital plan. You've seen a lot of these plans in the in the past. The Earth Center don't have to tell you about that. Um, there, there is always going to be a need for a transit. Uh, connection near F and Harris. And right now, the, the, the Joann's, I, I joke that that is probably the best transit served Joann's uh, store in the country. It's got all these buses sitting out front sometimes, uh, but it's not a very uh, attractive place. It doesn't have very good amenities, so a, a potential there. Uh, Willow Creek is a important connection uh, with Trinity Transit. Um, and a modest mobility hub there, some better shelters and, and park and ride is something that in particular Caltrans has been looking for at or would like to look at. Uh, a transit hub in McKinleyville, I mentioned that. Uh, and I don't have to tell you about the substantial uh, plans for the operations center improvements that are very much needed. Um, more capital plan elements. Um, the Arcata Transit Center is starting to show its age and is not particularly attractive. Um, and I think there are people that are concerned that it's it doesn't feel safe. Um, there are some things that can be done kind of site-wise, um, uh, site improvements to, to freshen it up and make it um, a little bit more safe for, for the riding public. Um, but it's always going to be in kind of an inconvenient location. Um, the city of Arcata in particular would like to, to have to see a study on looking at different options for those uh, different locations, perhaps taking that current location and making it more affordable housing there and moving that use somewhere out closer to the to 101. Um, there's a lot of discussion in here about microtransit technology to make all this microtransit work and to make all the the apps work in the dispatch service and that's something that hta and greg have been working hard to implement there we have discussion in here about park and ride options that really tie in with the with the express service um, and there's one that's been are we've, we there's a long discussion in here you either want to be really close to the activity center um, which like the southwest corner of us 101 and sunset avenue so you're just you're almost within a walking distance of campus there. Um, that's one option. Or you want to be kind of further away so that people have enough benefit in terms of travel time um, to, to offset the, the inconvenience of transferring to the bus. Uh, and in looking around, one of the things that we've done in other areas in, is not rather than 
building big new parking lots uh, is to make, see where we can make better use of existing parking lots. Um, and this would take some more work and more study, but there's a lot on the north side of Bayshore Mall that it seems is, is almost never used if, if ever is filled. Um, there's the opportunity during the weekday uh, at the Bear River Casino to, to make an agreement for shared use parking there. It's not far off of 101. Um, we'd be interested as to whether the large parking lots at the College of the Redwoods are really fully needed uh, given current uh, in, uh, enrollment and maybe a shared parking agreement there. Um, and then the, the big old Fortuna Mill site and whether there's a potential to do modest improvements to that um, it seems like a it's something to look at too. Um, bus stops are important uh, throughout the system. There's a variety of good and bad and 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 uh, un, you know unattractive bus stops. So an access improvement plan that could look at the safety and convenience of bus stops, we we suggest that happens. Um, the transit staffs have done a good job on getting everyone lined up for zero emission bus technology and getting funding for that. So we're essentially just folding that into our plan here. I don't think I need to say too much about that other than it takes a lot of money. Um, and I think this is and this is our the impact of what our, our plan will need for expanding services. Not too much, but there is a particularly a need for for additional vans for microtransit and then two uh, fixed route buses for express service. Um, marketing, there's a lot of discussion in here also about marketing and how we can we can expand uh, kind of uh, the public's perception um, and awareness of public transit. One of the things that that we really kind of rely on is the idea of developing a regional brand for all the services um, and making that consistent. There's there's confusion among all the different systems and how they tie together. We've got a bigger, a better system than people realize um, because they tend to think of it as individual services that are not uh, tied together. And as we implement this plan, we will be better tied together. Um, so we've got some kind of very specific things in here about website improvements and writer's guides. Um, and so on, uh, events to to particularly increase awareness on the university and college campuses. Um, I'm getting close to the end here, I'm running out of steam. Um, the institutional plan, uh, this is this is where we kind of think bigger picture about uh, how everything fits together. There is some discussion in here about update, uh, updating and and applying some performance standards, some numerical numbers of things like passengers per vehicle hour and so on, so that uh, we can um, kind of rationally figure out what makes sense and what doesn't. Um, institutionally, one of the things that's coming up is the Yurok tribe is doing their own separate transit plan, uh, which is why they're not particularly included here other than, you know, by reference, but as they do that plan, let's let's coordinate those plans. Um, we are always a big at, um, proponents for encouraging transit-oriented land use planning, and some of this is already it's it's happening. Things like um, the Earth Center and so on. Let's get more people in the future living closer to transit hubs, um, and that makes their their potential to use it all that much greater. Um, uh, last thing on this screen that we didn't put in the plan, but we encourage you to look at as perhaps a next step is the, the potential of doing away with transit fares, perhaps for some people, perhaps for all people, all riders. Uh, there, we've, there's a great st start with the, the university free pass program, um, but there is lots of evidence these days that getting rid of even a modest fare, you know, a dollar seventy fare or something, can generate about a thirty or forty or percent increase in transit ridership, essentially for very little net cost. Um, you know, in the big picture of things, we've got buses that are emptier than they were five years ago because of pandemic and changes. Now we could fill them back up 
uh, without adding new buses by by making it a free system. Um, it does take additional outside funding, but many transit systems find that that's a cheaper way to get more people on the bus than um, putting more buses out on the road. Um, some more kind of in the weeds institutional things. Uh, the There's a big change in the availability of federal transit funding if you're an urbanized area. And an urbanized area is defined by the, the Department of Census um, or, uh, to uh, based on population and population density and continuity of, con of population density. And it's a very complicated thing. You have to have over 50,000 people, which we do. Mm -hmm. We have to have it in a continuous area without any gaps of lower density areas, uh, including water. Uh, so that's a, a challenge like including Arcata and Eureka into one urbanized area. But um, we looking at it, it seems awfully close that we could be designated or there could be a Eureka urbanized area and that allows us to generate urban transit funds. That's what funds all the big transit systems in big urban areas. Um, and it, that would be worth a kind of a specialized study by an expert in that field. Um, as I mentioned, this is a short range plan and there is a need for a long range transit plan, particularly when we get into evaluating the, the benefits of land use changes as it affects transit and starts to support transit service. That's where a long range, like a 20 year plan really comes into place. Uh, there's also a planning process called a comprehensive operational assessment, which dives into even further detail on the route, pulp op, the routing strategies and the service strategies. It also these days is a, a, a COA as they're known, um, can, um, really dive into looking at cell phone based data, what's called big data and comparing actual travel patterns with where the transit, the bus service goes and making sure that we're doing as much as we can to match where people are really going. Um, and then the, the last one at the bottom there is a, is a uh, item for a institutional structure study. I think in the big picture, um, what has happened is the area has grown, the needs have grown. We've got, we've got more growth in certain areas, particularly McKinleyville, Arcata, parts of Eureka than we do down in South County. Um, and so a, um, looking at how the, you know, whether there is a need for combining systems in a, in a more formal way, we're doing a lot of this on the ground and, um, uh, but doing that on an institutional uh, basis so that perhaps more of the funding uh, that say comes through HCOG gets allocated directly to transit um, in the future. That's the sort of thing that, that a institutional structure study can look at. I think right now we're seeing that it's getting, it's starting to get in the way of being able to implement improvements. Uh, the, 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 the current very long standing, decades old uh, current institutional structure. Um, so, quick summary here of what does this plan do, and I always hold my breath when I get to this slide or I get to this part of the study because we want the ridership increase to be more than the cost increase, uh, at least on a percentage basis. So you can see here kind of the big picture, HTA service as a whole, including ETS and everything, about 700,000 more annual passenger trips, that's almost a doubling of transit ridership when fully implemented, but it's about a 24% increase in um, operating costs. So we're, we're making the system more efficient by increasing ridership more than we're increasing costs. Um, for ANMRTS, uh, about uh, over a doubling of ridership with that third uh, bus and with microtransit and with a slight expansion of hours, it is a pretty substantial increase in, in operating costs. It's a 72% increase in 1.1 million there. Um, so again, that is going to take some new funding uh, strategies, uh, but it is making it more efficient. Uh, for Tuna Transit, we do have a substantial percent increase in ridership. Um, it's a more challenging place to get the next person on the bus uh, because we're, we're putting it into micro transit and it's and it's lower uh, efficiency. So we do have costs going up higher than, than a ridership there. Or, yeah. 
Um, one kind of an aside here, but it certainly was an aside as we did the study. We Part of this plan was looking at Cal Poly Humboldt and how can we support that and what makes sense in terms of the plan elements that really start to change, move the needle, as they say, change, change how uh, people are getting to and from the campus. So what you see here is the elements that we've pulled out and said, these are the things that really start to to benefit Cal Poly. Um, and it's, it's the express service, it's the new service, the new green route service, it's the microtransit and the service improvements in the other communities that feed into the express service and the park and rides. Uh, I would encourage someone to take this chart here and go march up the hill to Cal Poly um, and say, look at these benefits you're getting. Um, we're hoping you can be a funding partner as we as we start to do these things. So I um, I am basically have worked my way through the whole thing here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and but but I bet Beth, do you have anything um, to add as I wrap up? I just thank you. That was that was great. I feel like we just uh, relived like almost two years of our lives there um that that was uh, it's been it's been a process and we're just so grateful for their effort because as you can tell they were really thorough and we did get a lot of public comments we got a lot of comments from the operators and we were able to um you know i, I will say the consultants uh, lsc gordon and claire were, were so accommodating as those things came in and kind of looking at it new and, and i think it's mentioned in the staff report that uh, cal poly humboldt did contribute financially to this study so that they could be more integrated um so that was um um, that was a little bit of a late addition, though. So the, they were also um, the LSC team was very flexible with us to be able to, you know, really kind of get that information after we already started, but but be able to incorporate it really thoroughly. So um, and and so yeah, just you know, grateful for Gordon for his presentation and for the whole effort over over this last um, time that we've been working on it. And then in terms of the action today, so there's a couple different options. Um, if you know. It, first you know please ask all the questions that was a lot of information we just heard so please you know we want to dialogue with gordon here a little more um but then the option to either adopt this document as is or to you know seek some clarification request some changes and and we can bring it back for adoption at a later date so those those options are both available um it's you know we, we want to get this thing adopted but there's not like a hard and fast deadline for it so we also want to make sure it's reflective um of what you know what the board wants to see so just kind of that person procedural um, and then I turn it back over for questions all right thank you and thank you Gordon and Claire for your work on there and we'll we'll see if we have any questions here from the board this, I don't, mayor Jones yeah hi hi Gordon thank you um, I'm the mayor of a, of a small town about six miles east on 299 and I was actually going to mention tonight um, during my uh, director report to thank Humboldt Transit Authority, but something happened in Blue Lake that was rather sudden. We were giving our transit funds, um, allocating them to the Blue Lake Rancheria, which is a rancheria adjacent to our little town. They were taking that $34,000 a year and operating a transit system. Um, they gave the city of Blue Lake about two weeks notice that they were going to discontinue their service as of October 7th. So it was very difficult for our small staff, but they pulled together uh, with Humboldt Transit Authority and got um, some transit out to our city uh, very quickly. And I want to thank Humboldt Transit Authority for that, by the way. Um, we serve about 20 students that are coming to Arcata High from east of Blue Lake that are not in the system to be able to take the school bus because they were technically out of the district of Arcata High. But anyway, I, I would like to see some sort of um, inclusion of Blue Lake in this plan if it's possible um, and appropriate because um, we are in need of continued service out there in Blue Lake, and we have made an agreement. It's tentative at this point, but I think we would love to see it uh, more definite and um, more permanent. So anyway, just a little information for you, and then just, and just not a question actually, but just something I'd like to see possibly in the plan. Thank you. Thank you. 
Supervisor Arroyo. Thank you. Um, this was uh, really good, and um, I'm really excited that we, you know, we're seeing reflected in here a lot of the things that, um, you know, um, that our board have heard and are, are working towards, and, and that's, you know, certainly by design, so I appreciate that. Um, and I, I did have a question. It was a little unclear to me. I, I truly may have just missed it, but um, whether the higher priority as far as um, increasing ridership and efficiency of operations was to put on that express service or the earlier weekday, earlier and later weekday service, because right now my understanding is our board is focusing on really meeting that priority of the earlier um, weekday earlier and later weekday service so um is the are they sort of ranked as far as their um the these different options as far as their effectiveness yes our our analysis indicates that the express service is a more efficient way to spend you know the next set of dollars um rather than expanding hours of service. You really start to, you've got a good span of service now, um, other than Sunday, um, but you the ridership there is, is um, less like per hour of service. We really see that express service as being, you know, we can start with just one bus and um, really start to have something that we can sell to serve both existing passengers as well as start to build some new market. So our, there's a lot of details in the, in the appendices in particular, but in terms of overall efficiency, we'd say to focus on the RTS side on the express service first. Thank you. That's great to know. Um, Chair Johnson, may I ask a couple more? I have, I have them written down, so they should be succinct. All right. Um, with Fortuna, um, so, uh, you know, that's one of the systems where Fortuna has their own vehicles, um, currently operates a, as a senior service only. Um, and so I see the recommendations in here um, to expand that into more of a dial ride uh, or not a um, like a micro transit system from its existing iteration. Um, do you think there are any efficiencies um, to be gained by consolidating operations of, of that? I, you know, I. I think that the whether or not we want to do that is a different question, but I'm just curious about um, whether there are improvements that could be made by, you know, having common dispatching. I saw that the recommendation in here about how using the same software. Right. Uh, we didn't specifically look at the question of say whether the Fortuna system should be operated by, by HTA. Um, that, might be part of that institutional study. Um, so I, I, I will admit that that's not something that we have specifically looked at. Um, we did spend a lot of time looking at how changing the RTS or implementing microtransit allows the RTS buses to stay kind of uh, just on the main streets and not go off to the, to the east there and serve the hospital and places like that. Um, but that's a valid question about whether turning those funds directly over to HTA. I think that's what you're asking about. Um, and then um, having that operated as, as a whole, I, I would be hazarding a guess if I were to, to guess right now. Okay, so. thank you. And I just want to clarify over at HTA, we're not trying to do a big power grab for everybody's systems. But um, I know the experience with Eureka was that um, it was... Uh, uh, a, a pretty good increase in efficiency and, and save staff a lot of um, time and energy. <laughs> so there were, there were some good things about it, but um, those, those conversations can always be had. And then my, my last question, uh, and this actually really, this topic was resurrected at a first five meeting today. Um, you know, one of the conversation topics that came up was around um, people wanting to provide um, transit passes that are not just a month pass or a day pass for clients um, and have like reloadable, refillable um, cards of some kind. Um, we do we do currently have the top on, top off to pay, but people have to be banked or buy a uh, something that has a chip. So a refillable bank card could be used. However, and this is a very niche question, but 
for people that are, say, providing social services, um, they may not want to give their clients a bank card that can be used for anything. They want it specifically to be used for transportation. Um, and at our recent transit conference, um, it looked like there were some options that other systems um, had been using, but I, I don't really know more about what that is. Do you have um, recommendations around that that you've seen in all your experience with other transit agencies? Yeah, yes, there are cards that, you know, big chip enabled cards that are only valid for tapping on and tapping off um, on bus services in larger urban areas. And I know that HTA staff has been working diligently to implement that um, and kind of been been a leader in that that we've seen in the in the region. Um, and it's got some real advantages. One of the, the things that it allows um, a transit agency to do is to cap the total fare that people have to pay, say, within a week or within a month. Um, and if you, you're a regular user and you get to, you've used up your, you've, you've, you're now tapping more than $40 worth of, of boardings, um, it'll cap you there and just say you've got the rest of the, the month for free. So it tends to... Um, it tends to benefit those who use the system more, most. So it is certainly financially uh, possible to do that, physically possible. I just wanted to say that that was brought up at our meeting last night, is that some people don't, their bank cards don't have chips as well. And so um, I think that that is a good possible idea. Yep. And I, I see a few hands raised. Yeah, I was getting to that. Mayor Burgell. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, very thorough. Um, the thing that kind of stuck out with me was this whole business of, um, out of all of that, <laughs> um, free fare options to increase ridership. I know other cities do that, um, and I'm wondering, is that something, uh, maybe this is a question for Beth, is this something that we're going to be looking into? Um, we had someone at council on Tuesday night who um, took, she took, I think she took a microtransit. Anyway, it was $18 for her to go to Arcata. And she was, she's an elderly woman who doesn't have a lot of money. It might have been dial-a-ride. But the point being is that um, that can be really expensive for our senior citizens. $18 to go to Arcata, that seemed to me a bit outrageous. Um, so I would like to see us leaning more towards um, no fees. Uh, I know Portland does that, and it seems to work out really well. Um, I think they do that. Maybe they just do that on the train. I'm not sure. I'd have to look further. But I just feel like that could really be an, an option for people to, to get around easier. Yeah, I will say that there's, I think, been some free fare promotions over the years, you know, sort of like limited duration time to kind of incentivize ridership. Um, I think at the moment, and maybe Natalie, um, PAC member Arroyo can share more, but um, really, you know, my understanding of what we're focusing on about is really fare capping and, and dial a ride's kind of a different different story with the zones and, and we need to do some work on that in general with some of the efficiency and the way the costs are, are shared. But um, uh, when it comes to fare capping, you know, there's like, I think we're at like $2 for two hours or something. And that's with the tap on tap off, which is so great because, um, and is it now, is it seven or $8 per day that we'll max out? So anyway, basically there'll be, if you use the same card and you get on and off the bus with it, it knows when you've spent your max for that day and it won't keep charging you. Everything else is essentially a free ride. So you're never going to be in this situation where you spent $32 on the bus rides today. Um, but, um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know all the exact amounts right off the top of my head, but, um, but yeah, I think that that's, that's definitely something that HTA is working towards is that fair capping and you know making sure that it's very cost effective and and certainly a lot of discussions around free fares and the value of that I think is well understood um, there's a little bit of some legal background on that that there's always been that fair box recovery ratio sometimes we hear about that would it meet the the fair box and you had to actually show that you were um, earning 10 percent of of the cost from from fares so it wasn't overly subsidized that's been put on hold after COVID and there's a chance it may not come back at all. So that that will be a little bit liberating um, if we can get rid of that. And then you think, you know, free fares really become a, a better option. Great. Thank you. Since you mentioned me, can I yes. add on? Yes, please. Um, I, I, um, 
so I think the free fares is something that we could certainly keep exploring. Um, we're not really, we, we'd have to make some uh, shifts over time to how we finance all of our operations because that's not how we're currently set up. So it'd be a, a major structural sh- shift, but definitely worth exploring. And, um, you know, we, we certainly want to increase ridership um, very much. Um, with respect to the dial ride system, so we are... Um, the, it may have been that the person who participated was a traditional dollar ride user. Um, and so people were either age qualified or disability qualified to use the system. But now we're opening that up and it's um, it's a bit of a soft launch um, to expand that to um, to serve as a micro transit function. Um, the reason it's um, not really being heavily promoted right now is that um, we are working out um, the dispatching and timing kinks. Um, mm-hmm. But the idea is that people can use an app and similar to hailing an Uber or Lyft or whatever ride sharing um, vehicles um, or a cab, um, they could, instead of getting that door to door service, so traditional dial ride service is door to door in part because um, uh, it exists for people who can't use fixed route transit. Um, but we're realizing that those vehicles are running extremely inefficiently. They're often empty, often rides get canceled as Gordon mentioned. So, um, there's a lot of inefficiencies in the system and that system is currently operated by CAE transport, um, under contract with us. So we don't own the vehicles. So those are HTA, um, operated and dispatched, um, or dispatched, I should say, but they're operated and maintained by CAE under contract. So it's a, um, it's an asset that we have as a community and, you know, we have these five or six vehicles running around at any given time and, and a lot of times they're empty. Mm-hmm. So the goal was to really fill those seats um, by, uh, but we can't, there's for a variety of reasons, we're not allowed to really compete with those um, other service providers. So we need to be giving people a ride from one transit stop to another. Mm -hmm. Um, Those don't necessarily have to be on the same route. So they could go from like a transit stop in Eureka over by the zoo, say, to, um, you know, one near Mad River Hospital and then, you know, go back to a different transit stop and use a fixed route, um, you know, ride. And so people could cobble together a ride of amongst those options. But the dial ride is um, is currently more expensive because it's dispatching a vehicle that's currently, you know, out ready to be used, but for that specific ride, um, rather than the efficiencies of that fixed route service. So I I hope that helps a bit. And we are really aiming to use that to fill some gaps. Um, They can go a little further. They can go to places where there's not fixed route service, like the Samoa Peninsula, um, you know, south of the bridge, the the town of Samoa um, is going to have that option. So we're excited about it and, um, you know, we'll see how it works and it's still less efficient. And so as Gordon mentioned, we really need to look at the structure of the fares and, um, and just figure out some, answer some big questions about how we use resources to get people around. I mean, we certainly want people to be able to, who can't, you know, can't get from place to place any other way to be able to get to the doctor and stuff like that. And there's also, you know, there's senior resource center vehicles. There's all these different programs and and processes that people can engage in to get around and um so i think it's a bigger conversation and it's it's a huge set of challenges but but right now people should be able to take those vehicles um a little later and a little earlier than when we currently have service and to different destinations and kind of on demand as long as those vehicles are available and they're able to use the app so that was probably more information than you wanted, but you know me. Very thorough, yes. <laughs> so I'm curious then, will dial ride people still have the priority? Yes. Yes. Okay. They will have priority, and those rides can be scheduled in advance, and they will be door-to-door service, um, but those are the most expensive alternative. Gotcha. But they're still um, – I did a little um, checking, and it sort of depends different times of day. Like I, I kind of like – pulled up my Uber and Lyft app and I didn't hail a ride, but I looked to see how much it would be if I were to hail it. Um, and then compared that to what our zone map is. And, and it's, um, it's a little less to, to use this service. So we're hoping that will, um, incentivize people using it they do have to go from a stop to a stop so it'll help them figure out like what stops closest and, and, you know, and then tell them how soon their ride will be there. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other questions I, mean, I got a couple but okay it looks like supervisor madrone has joined us online uh, and he's got his hand up 
Okay, Supervisor Madrone. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I wanted to support what uh, Mayor Jones was saying about Blue Lake, making sure it's in the plan and that they, you know, can be able to get service and stuff. I also appreciate HTA responding so quickly to the cancellation of that service by adding that as a stop for the Willow Creek run. But, you know, there's a lot of danger there in adding something like that to what is an express route for students and parents that are already getting up at probably six in the morning to get to the bus in time to get to school in time. And it may not seem like a big deal to pull off into Blue Lake, but it probably adds about 15 minutes to the to the route. And then there's talk that there's also a, a stop at Valley West on demand for that same express route. And when you start doing that, you start losing ridership. And so I just, I hope that's just a short-term fix and that we can work with Blue Lake to provide long-term systems and keep the Willow Creek express route express. So thank you. Thank you. And I believe Latanya is up there. Thank you. Um, I have several <laughs> questions. Um, I'll start with uh, Fortuna. Uh, Anya, could you, could you please, we're going to get through the board questions and then we'll open it up for public comment. Sorry about that. Okay. So my question is for Gordon and it pertains to table 41 in the plan. It's Fortuna Transit Service Alternative Summary. And I just wanted to make sure that I was reading it right and understood because our, our person that was working with, the, with you guys to develop this is no longer at the city of Fortuna and we're playing catch up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And on there, it talks about the maintaining the status quo and the operating costs is 218,112 and ridership with fair revenues meet leaving. It says a operating subsidy, which I'm assuming is the operating cost of 202,000. Is that right? Am I reading? Well, it? that's, that's, that's the operating the public dollars in addition to the fair revenues that is needed. Right. Is the 202,000. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that's after the fares, that's the cost to the agency, whether it be Humboldt transit or the city of Fortuna. So, yeah, that's what, that's what it takes. Okay. And then down there underneath that, it says service alternatives, a change with implementing micro transit, and it's 194,000 for the operating cost with an assumed ridership of 4,100 and I'm deducting it's 181,900. But is that also en encompassed in that? Does that encompass the people that were formerly in the dial -a ride or is this in addition to the dial -a ride? This is, this is expanding the dial -a ride it's going to take more vehicles, you know, one more vehicle over a certain number of hours um, per day to provide enough capacity. Um, one of the challenges on microtransit is that if you've got five people who call you up or use the app and they are all over town, um, it's about as many people in an hour that you can serve. It's about five people per hour on a, on a, in a community that's about the size of Fortuna. So we do need to add some additional, you know, like a, a, a second van some hours, a third van some hours, uh, so that we can accommodate the general public on top of the dial right. So it's all one service. Um, and as was mentioned, the, dial, the people with disabilities would always be number one in terms of uh, accommodating their ride but then we would be adding some hours to serve other people too. And that's where this additional dollars and additional hours of service come from. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I figured, but I wanted to clarify that before I made a hard yeah. stand. <laughs> Cause that's a significant addition in revenue that we'd have to scrape together from someplace. It doesn't come out of nowhere. That's Just, true. I think it's, uh, comes to about $43 a ride. So 
for the additional 4,100 people. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's pretty much my question, getting that clarified. I appreciate what you've put together in there and all the work that you've put into it. And for someone, a bigger agency with better revenue, they probably have a, a better chance of making some of those decisions and getting it done. So is there any other board questions? If not, we'll open public comment. Yeah, if I could, could I lead us in, the, in a little public comment, um, if, if I may? Um, just, I think a good protocol would be if we have any public comment in the room first and then public comment on Zoom. And um, I would suggest that um, after we hear all the public comment, that if your board could um, direct our consultant as to what to respond to, if anything, um, it just so, so we're not, you know, in a freestyle dialogue, but I'm um, just kind of, so those are my public comment. Well, is there any public comment from the audience? <laughs> and seeing none, we'll move to the online public comment. I think our first hand is for LaTanya. Okay, uh, now is that the time to speak? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, I, there was a lot of material covered, a lot of ground covered, and I'm just, going to try to go back. Uh, I'll start with Fortuna. Did I understand correctly that the, there's a mini transit in Fortuna, which is the Dalarai? And are they looking to eliminate runs from the um, RTA or RTS? I'm sorry. Oh, oh. To um, the mini transit? It meaning that if you need to go, if you live in Eureka and you need to go to the Fortuna Clinic, the HTA or the RTS, I'm sorry, the RTS will not be taking you to that place. You would have to rely on the RTS to get you to the main um, route and then catching a mini transit from the main route to the Fortuna Clinic, is that what you're saying? Uh, well, the, we'll write that down and, and follow up. If you have another question after that? Yeah, I have several questions, quite a few questions. But I know other people have to speak. So, but I wanted to make, get clarification on that. And also about the um, Sunday service, um, am I to understand that you're not going to pursue Sunday service other than what's in Arcata, meaning the RTS from, I don't know, Trinidad, Trinidad California, to um, the other, other end of the uh, route for the RTS. You, you don't, you're not opening that up because it, it looks like it's, on, it's limited service on Sunday, if it is service on Sunday. Um, if I could jump in. Um, so, Latonya, I'd be happy to meet with you offline and go over the details in, in the plan um, and then reserve this time for public comment. So if you have any any comments um, and then we can get your questions answered on the side. You know, what we're doing, what, what this plan does is make essentially a series of recommendations. There's, there's no changes in transit service that are happening um, immediately as a result of this plan. Um, so it's just uh, the recommendations moving forward and there'll be more decisions to come in terms of which ones are going to get implemented at which times. Um, so um, I'm happy to talk through that with you offline, um, but reserve this time for comments rather than questions. OK. OK, if that is that OK. <laughs> well, is there anything that other follow up that we'd like to make with uh, our consultants? Okay, do we have a direction, a motion? Or would you want to table it until for follow-up at a later time? Well, I was just wondering with the concerns for Blue Lake, like do we, should we table that and come back to it after Blue Lake's been considered or I'm, I'm not sure of the process, so I'm asking. Yeah, we can, um, you know, we, we can look at, um, 
a slight amendment you know they're the are they've wrapped up their work and and we have but we can you know it's kind of a new question because we wrap this up you see the dates right september 27th is when we put and then just we had such short notice so so it is interesting that you know i mean it was kind of like just really breaking news um so i think you know we could we can make that ask and i could talk with them about it and and you know if if the rest of it seems you know reasonable we don't have changes we could just kind of come back with that revised language um, for blue lake and you know we'll work with lse to kind of come up with a timeline for how quickly they could analyze that um if that sounds good to to gordon as well um and bring that back at a later time and then you know just kind of come back with the revised language regarding blue lake and then formal adoption at that time may i ask a question about that are you talking about the idea of Blue Blue Lake joining the Joint Powers Authority that is Humboldt Transit Authority or about adding additional analysis of service in Blue Lake? I wasn't sure. Because one of them would come to us for, you know, consideration. We'd have to amend the the JPA if, if um, you know, because Blue Lake's not currently a member, but, um, you know, that, that could be done. It, it's just a, a sort of a different question. Was it clear? Yeah, I, I apologize for the for the haste of this um, information because it was for us also hasty. Um, and I'm not sure formally how we should go about this. I mean, I know that it's a short term um, agreement at this point. I would like to see it be long term, but I don't know if the TAC needs to talk. You know, our city manager can talk during our technical advisory committee meeting to formalize this more or. You know, I mean, this is a draft at this point that's been um, brought before us. I'm fine with adopting the draft with the possibility of amending it at a further time if necessary. Um, yeah, and I think our ask would be to kind of look at all of what you just said is like, does it mean, you know, should, if we're having a stop there and it's HTA having that stop, does that mean they should be part of the JPA? You know, so just really kind of looking at that, um, you know, kind of, even that institutional structure was sort of on the list of things to study further, even even without you know a potential addition of another city. So um, I think there's a lot we could like dive into with that, but not you know still keeping it fairly contained, um, but but be able to answer that and you know kind of like yeah, th there's also um, can it be accomplished with just you know cost sharing for for what it takes to to get the HTA bus out there. Um, so you know maybe Gordon could share some thoughts, not necessarily right this second. I don't want to put him on the spot, um, or maybe maybe he's happy. To, to answer but just looking at all of that um you know what is the most efficient option moving forward right right and i don't want to hold up this process if we want to adopt this um even though it is a draft this evening with the possibility of it becoming a an amendment later on i'm fine with that i think it does need to be talked about in the technical advisory committee meeting perhaps further and more information can be garnered from that Gordon, you're on mute. Somebody did that to me. <laughs> um, if I could make a suggestion, you know, this is this happens I, all the time uh, because of the process, and it takes you know a month or two to go from you've got a draft document to you're presenting to the board, um, and the world changes. The world the world moves at uh, a rapid clip. Um, what I would suggest is that we put a we craft a paragraph that goes in the plan that says, you know, that gives kind of a plan element to look at at that eight, that there need there is a need for transit service. And some of the options are we could look at what does it take for Willow Creek to divert and does that really meet the needs for things like school trip times or there could be some other extension of HTA service those are those would be valid options um, but it is going to take some discussion um, on the institutional and financial side too I would say that given where we are um, that's out kind of outside of the scope of, of you know what we've been doing for the last year but if we at least have a placeholder there um, so that it's in the plan that this is something going forward um, that people will look at and then that could be an amendment to this plan at a future date. Um, and then you could adopt the draft plan uh, with that caveat that that addition is going to be made. You can 
draft something along the lines of adopt the 2023-2028 transit development plan with the knowledge that there is a need for transit for the Blue Lake community. And yeah. Does that sound good to everybody? <laughs> yeah, that sounds that sounds good to me. Um, uh, the HCOG board adopt the 2023-2028 transit development plan. I, I move that with um, an additional uh, paragraph to be put in by staff concerning the needs of the city of Blue Lake. I will second that. And is, uh, is this a voice vote or a... Um, yeah, it's a, okay. If you want to ask the public. Just Is there any public comment? Oh, no. Oh, we make no, a motion public and you're comment. second. <laughs> then yeah, right. So I was going to do. And then vote. Okay. Motion made by Adeline Jones. There's motion motion made by Adeline Jones and second by Stacey? and Mayor, Stacey. former Stacey. Council Stacey. Member Stacey. Atkins Stacey. Salazar. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any further discussion? And, and it, is, is any further discussion? All right. Well, at this time, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Now, after that adventure, <laughs> We have no informational items, and at this time we will, by motion, uh, adjourn and reconvene as the HCOG board and approve the pack of recommendations. Can we say so moved? So moved. <laughs> Second. Second. Well, Second. motion it. Pardon? You move to reconvene, right. yes. and I have a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And at this time, we'll vote. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. <laughs> One more aye, no oppose. <laughs> All right, so done. Now we'll come to staff and PAC member reports with the executive director's report. All right, thanks. Well, I get to start off my report. Um, First off, I think uh, just a quick thank you to, to Claire and Gordon for being here. Um, I want to make sure they know they can log off or if they're really excited to hear this exciting news, they should stay on. Um, so we were awarded the REAP 2.0 grant that we applied for at the end of last year. It took a very long time to get the information. So um, this was a, we received $2.7 million. Um, the things we're supporting with these funds are the We Are Up Housing Development Project in McKinleyville and also, um, pertinent to what we were just discussing, um, McKinleyville microtransit system. So um, that was a package we had put together. And uh, the, if, I'm, I'm sure most um, were here and remember, but the We Are Up project is uh, about 50 units that's proposed in McKinleyville, um, just behind the grocery outlet off of Central. And it is going to be a housing uh, complex for people with and without disabilities. And um, the first of its kind in our region and um, first of its kind really, um, you know, kind of state wide as well um, so it's very very exciting and um, I just want to really thank you know Humboldt Transit Authority um, for partnering with us in terms of the micro transit system and the we are up nonprofit for partnering with us on that they really are going to be the two agencies having to do the hard work and actually implementing um, the grant um, that we will be just administering the funds for by and large um, but then also special thanks to the HCOG team this was a grant that was due on New Year's Eve um, which was a Saturday and <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I really just have to, uh, especially Stevie Luther, we, we, you know, we worked through, you know, the Christmas holiday, um, putting it together. And then, yeah, that special deadline, um, which was one unlike I've seen before. So um, just really thankful that we, you know, that, that your board gave us the direction to proceed with the grant. Um, and it's just, it's a big win. And so we're so grateful to, to receive those funds. Um, the next thing I want to mention is uh, October 28th from noon to six, we'll be having the housing 
exhibition. So this is next Saturday. It's at the Jefferson Community Center um, with the with the original REAP funds we received. Uh, you'll remember we've been watching some videos here occasionally um, in terms of uh, hiring artists to do different forms of art related to furthering the discussion around housing. So we've had we'll have the videos playing. We have a comic book that was printed out, um, and we'll have those to distribute. Um, there is an artist who will be making a sculpture regarding housing that will be on display that day. Um, and we, I believe we'll have the still photographs as well um, that we commissioned. So it should be kind of a compilation of all the different artists' work um, that we've engaged with during this process. And uh, we'll send out to the board the save the date for that. We're hoping to um, have, you know, mainly it's an open house from, from noon to six, but uh, again, at the Jefferson Community Center here in Eureka, um, but also um, hoping to kind of schedule a couple touch points along that open house for, you know, maybe some speakers or some leading some discussions. So we're still working on that little piece of it, but um, invite you all to attend. Um, and then uh, the next thing I want to mention is it, uh, it is the STIP cycle. Um, I think I, I brought it up at our last meeting that we have um, actual funds this year. This is the State Transportation Improvement Program, um, one of our biggest sources of discretionary funding that we get to put towards local streets and roads projects um, and also um, could go towards highway projects. This has been the funding source that has been uh, we've been contributing to the, the Indianola project um, with that is that you know is currently under construction but this cycle we have uh, about 8.5 million dollars to program um, the TAC has been working through that we did a call for projects they have brought projects forward um, so this next month they will be voting on the final slate of projects and a priority for that and we'll be forming that into the regional transportation improvement program um, and that will come to you next month um, that will be a time sensitive vote that we need to take so um you know, we did an early quorum call for next month, um, and we we look like we're good for a quorum. Uh, but just if there's some reason you can't make it, please let us know. We want to coordinate with alternates early because it really is essential on that day. Um, because we'll need to get uh, that document off to the state um, before our next board, before the following board meeting. So um, we don't we don't want to wait on that. Um, but the tax doing a good job getting getting through those projects and um, you know coming up with recommendations to send to your board. Um, and that is um, yeah, that's that's all. I've got, yeah, just the, the November board meeting. In addition to the STIP, we will have a presentation uh, from Caltrans on the road charge uh, committee updates. Um, so that will that will be important. Um, so we'll have kind of a, a large agenda that evening. So I guess just a heads up to, you know, we'll be in it for the long run. So just uh, be ready in November and uh, we'll be happy to, to get through the long agenda. All right. Thank you. Now we come to Caltrans report. Thank you. Um, an update on the Arcata 101 merge project. That's the one near Gentoli and Arcata. It's currently. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. How's that? Better? Okay. Um, as you know, it's currently under construction. The crew's been working on constructing a small retaining wall, which is now complete. Remaining work includes constructing fence, reconstructing embankment, and new roadway prism. And once completed in spring, the new lane will be paved and striped. So moving along, uh, Fern Bridge, the pile work is done and the gravel access road will be decommissioned. There will be one overnight closure in the coming weeks to do a seal on the roadway. The notice will be going out two weeks in advance so that'll be going out in about a week or two. Looking at some sort of seismic notification system and safety protocols in the event of another quake. Um, last chance grade. Uh, current, it's now open to two-way traffic for the first time in approximately nine years. Yeah. A press release went out uh, recently acknowledging the support from everyone who's helped make it happen, including removal of thousands of cubic yards of slide material, installation of mesh, wire mesh on the slopes, geotechnical investigations, signal installations, construction of stability enhancing walls, repairs, drainage system, railing installations, roadway realignments, paving, striping, and flagging, just a whole wide range of, of activity out there. So future stretches of traffic control will be inevitable and we're aiming to begin construction on a wall near Wilson Creek in 2027 and we're ready to respond to repair needs as they arise. We'll also be conducting future analysis related to the long-term solution and the draft environmental document for the long-term last chance grade solution is coming this winter. If all goes according to plan, we could begin construction as early as 2030. Um, and last, I uh, just wanted to 
uh, put out a reminder that the fiscal year 24-25 call for applications for the Sustainable Transportation Planning Grant Program opened on October 5th. Applications are due in um, January, January 18th. There's $53.4 million available for transportation and climate adaptation planning. Thank you. Well, thank you. A lot of good news in there, too. And any PAC member reports? <laughs> thank you. We covered a lot of it earlier. I was going to touch on the Blue Lake service, which um, was a, an estimated cost of around $30,000 that was going to be split between the city of Blue Lake and the uh, Blue Lake Rancheria. So, um, just, um, that's, that wasn't something that unfortunately we were able to do, um, at no cost, but we were able to do it really quickly as a board, um, to meet that need. So we have three stops going, uh, three fixed, um, stops going westbound <laughs> and two going eastbound. And, um, some of the main riders of that system on weekdays are high school students, um, as you mentioned, but also students come all the way from Willow Creek. So, um, not, not just, um, closer to town. So, um, the intention with the stop timings was really to make sure they can get there on time first and foremost. Um, and my understanding is that we were able to initiate that, um, a little while after our board voted on it within, within a week or so. So that is, that is running. Um, and, um, honestly, the timing of it was such that it ended right before a board meeting and we were able to get it on that agenda and get it done. So it was great to be able to fill that gap. And, um, and I don't think it's taking quite that long, but I, um, we were conscious of that. There were some community members that felt that it should stop in Glendale to go to the market as well and some other things, but, um, it's an intercity route. So it has, to, it's not intra-city and, um, some of that has to do with funding and, and operations, and so it, it needs to make pretty limited stops in between. So Supervisor Madrone is, oh, who left, is correct that it um, really needs to have limited stops um, by the function of it being intercity, but um, we were able to include those uh, without a substantial delay. Um, the top on, top off uh, system seems to be working really well. Um, and I keep promoting the transit app too. Um, if you download the transit app, it not only will um, show real time um, and routing information for local transit, but it works all over the place and is used really readily all over the country. So if you're traveling, you can use it. Um, and that fare capping is in place. So um, I forget what the daily fare cap is, um, but I know the monthly cap is $50. So if people are using their top on top off and they don't have a, a monthly pass, but they're riding enough to reach that um, fare cap, they will they will um, not have to pay more than that. So it's, um, it's really cool. So um, I think that is all I have for now. That transit app is not, however, the app that we're using for dispatch of dial ride. It doesn't quite have that functionality. Um, so I'll share an update about that, I think, at a future meeting because it's, um, there's a lot of stuff still being worked out. Um, but if anyone wants to go with me and ride it just for fun, uh, <laughs> just to try out a new thing, <laughs> let me know. Okay. Well, any other board member reports? Well, one thing I was going to bring up, talk, speaking of a transit card that's, uh, usable only on transit. I have a Orca card, which is part of Sound Transit, and they it works remarkably because you're going to use it on water taxi, ferry, uh, light rail, buses. It's a, a lot of different things, and they have some kind of capping up there because I first loaded it with twenty dollars, and in my head I was running some numbers, and I thought, oh, I need to put more on, so I put some more money on it and when I got back home I had $35 still <laughs> so that's see it's sound transit so sound. it goes way Seattle. south and it goes north but yeah that's true so if you look at something like that and then then up there they have one bus away is the app that I'm gonna use on my phone up there and it tells you where the bus is at and how many minutes until it arrives at the stop you're at and they may have, that may be the one you're using. I don't know, but it works well. And other than that, if there's nothing else, we will adjourn. Thank you.